Uh, my name is Benjamin Bolman. I am the CEO of Swiss Next Boston and its uh, New York office. Uh, we're very excited about this event as we've had an overwhelming interest so far and have uh, a really distinguished group of speakers uh, joining us today around such a, a critical topic. Uh, I am speaking today on behalf of both uh, Swiss Next Boston and Swiss Next Brazil as we have organized this event together uh, as part of our uh, anniversary campaign Next 20. So this is the the 20th anniversary of the, the whole Swiss Next Network. Uh, if you want to learn more about all our activities uh, around the anniversary, I encourage you to visit our respective uh, websites uh, as well as next20.ch. So for those who don't know us, uh, Swiss Next is a global network connecting Switzerland and the world in education, research, innovation, and the arts. We have five main locations, uh, San Francisco, Boston, Rio, Bangalore, and Shanghai and so-called science counselors in about 20 embassies uh, around the world. We are an initiative of the State Secretariat for Education, Research uh, and Innovation in uh, Bern, Switzerland, and are also part of the Swiss Confederations Network Abroad, uh, which is managed by the Federal uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we are all about bringing uh, people and ideas together uh, to make sense of uh, the profound transformations that our society is facing, and uh, if possible, somewhat unlock uh, some of the imagination we need uh, to collectively create uh, a different world. So the event today is all about how people and data intersect in urban spaces, which of course evokes uh, the issue of uh, surveillance. Uh, that said, uh, before I give the floor to uh, today's moderator, uh, my colleague Alicia Evangelista, who is our head of innovation, I would like to leave you with a slightly more positive uh, thought on the future of uh, our cities. Uh, there is a pretty strong statement uh, in the preamble of the, of the Swiss constitution that says that the strength of a people is measured by the well-being of its weakest members. So the question for me would be how uh, can digital technologies uh, first and foremost promote uh, the well-being of our weakest members instead of uh, perhaps controlling them? On that note, um, thank you again all on behalf of SwissNex Boston and SwissNex Brazil for joining us. Uh, I wish you a wonderful uh, event and over to you, Alicia. Thank you, Benjamin. And let me echo Benjamin in welcoming you all to this event uh, and also in stressing how pleased we are to have such a fantastic assembly of experts who bring perspectives from private industry, academia, government sectors, as well as a variety of different geographies across the world. We come together today to think about the future, informed by experiences of the past and present, and also a recognition that there are many questions still unasked about the future of cities, how we live in them, and how data will impact our individual lives. Today, we'll explore the status quo, um, as well as these questions through a keynote focused on data visualization and interpretation, as well as two panel discussions focused first on governance, infrastructure, and policy, and later on the human factor behind the data. A little note on logistics before we jump in. The chat function is open, so please, as attendees, feel welcome to uh, interact with the panelists through the chat function. Uh, there's also the question and answer function if you would like to pose a question to any of our panelists or keynotes. We'll try to include as much of the uh, chat and the question and answer as we can. Um, and this session will also be recorded if you want to go back and review it in the future. Having said that, I'd like to bring Yves Decor to the stage to introduce himself. Uh, you may recognize Yves name as the former Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Yves has also recently moved to Boston and today is working out of Swissnex, as you can see the logo behind his head. Um, so he will be acting as our commentator today, bridging the two panels together. Yves, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alicia. Very, very, very pleased to, uh, to be with, uh, with all of you. Um, I think there is no better, better theme, especially when you are right now in the US and around the world, about, as Benjamin uh, said, uh, about living not just tomorrow, but living together tomorrow. Uh, I think um, it is, and you can see our social fabric, our social contract are right now at risk. And again, not just in the US, I think globally. Uh, I'm deeply convinced that our two panel will be able to explore that. And I think they will also explore what I like so much is also the role of the city. I'm deeply convinced that the city are uh, an important place where our social contract, our us is really developing. And if you think about what the cities will do for us, it is really a central element. I'm myself right now in, in Boston, 
I was the director general of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and now I'm the fellow of the Berkman Climate Centers with really one focus, which is again, living together our social contract and how much cities will play a role in the coming years to try to bring that together or to keep it together. So up to the, to the panel right now, uh, and I will be uh, able and willing to join and comment and, and really put a little bit of great, uh, bit of salt <laughs> in, in the discussions. Uh, Alicia? Thank you, Yves. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Barbara Castro. Barbara is a data artist, a creative coder, and a researcher interested in human connectivity and regenerative cultures. She is a PhD professor at the Arts and Design Department of the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and her studio, Ambos, works with data visualization, interactive installations, and media art exhibitions. Welcome, Barbara. You can begin speaking whenever you are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Yves. Good afternoon. I'm ve very glad to be here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen uh, to make a presentation for you. Uh, share. Okay. Uh, are you seeing my presentation? Yes, looks great. Yes? Okay, great. Um, just here. Okay. I'm very glad to be here. Um, I would like to thank uh, Swissnex and all the panelists and attendees and of course Eves. Um, looking forward for this event. Um, so my name is Barbara Castro. Um, as designer, artist, teacher and creative coder, I work with data. This practice and my research in media art led me to enroll in the curatorship of two exhibits about data in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I will talk a bit, uh, a bit about them later. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm inspired by Georgia Lupis and, uh, Data Humanism Manifesto. She and Stephanie Pozavec created this beautiful project called Dear Data. They created personal data visualizations and shared them weekly in drawings on postcards. They learned how their perceptions of their own daily lives could be shaped by data. Then they published Observe, Collect and Draw, a journal to inspire people to experience these connections through hand-drawn visualizations. What is really precious about their project is that they can introduce data culture to anyone in a humane, non-technological approach. The first, the first line of the manifesto is all about small data. I would like to point this out for two reasons. Personal data, sometimes called sensitive data, is a key point when creating new public policies. And the second reason is that establishing practice for a caring city with regenerative cultures demands a local and specific experience for each context. From these small and successful experiences, we can create new models to be applied in other contexts with new adaptations. So um, when I first thought about what I wanted to say today, I thought about addressing data visualization as a medium to raise social and environmental awareness. But the word awareness in English deals with being watchful or vigilant and surveillance is a very delicate thing regarding the use of data. In Portuguese, I will use the word sensibilização, the process of becoming sentient, sensible about something. By emphasizing our senses, I think this Portuguese word embraces our bodily and aesthetic experiences. I'm not interested in aggravating a false brain-body dichotomy, I am indeed interested in taking data awareness to the next level by using more than just rationalization and logic. In other words, I want us to be able to use and feel data as a form of ex expression. The root of data production is the way we organize and communicate our senses and perceptions. This is also one of the ways we can say that art promotes connectivity. From this perspective, we could talk about how data visualization and data art somehow make us more sensible instead of rational. We hear a lot about how can we make decisions based on big data and algorithms. 
how we can make some fast, efficient and precise decisions. But I'm interested in how data can make us more present and more open to experience otherness. Because taking care of the other is to consider their needs and world worldview. <laughs> a, caring city, a caring city should promote this skill. As I said earlier, I worked in the team of two exhibitions about data in Rio. One of them was Data Corpus, that took place in Casa Pijan in 2019, in which I worked with Karina Araújo and Maria Isabel Chegui as a consultant in the curatorship team. At that time, I read an Instagram post from a visitor about how he was deeply impacted by the educational landscape visualization by Carolina Passos and Mapping Lab. This is a Brazilian data visualization that shows a density dot map that represents the population aged 25 and over by their highest level of education, made from joint data from the 2010 census IBGE and Atlas of Human Development in Brazil. This, um, so this was a text about, uh, from the visitor. And this is a very interesting project because it shows social boundaries that we experience in the city. The line between Gavia, one of the richest neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro, where is the university I teach, uh, and Rocinha, our biggest favela, is shown by the difference between the population that has incomplete basic education in pink and people with undergraduate or graduate degrees in green. This is an example about how a traditional informational data visualization can impact us and raise social awareness. The second example is more closely related to art. We featured Lisbon vessels by the Portuguese data visualization designer Pedro Miguel Cruz, who is a teacher at Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, Lisbon vessels is a creative coding animation developed with traffic data from Lisbon, for Portugal. It was part of the Existência Numérica exhibition at Oi Futuro. Uh, this was an art exhibition in 2018 that I conceived with Luiz Ludwig and Doris Kosminski. We received around 25,000 visitors in, this, in two months. Existência Numérica was an exhibition about data visualization as an art, emer, emergent artistic language. So Pedro's animation uh, presents an algorithm that distends the city roads as an obstructed vein. Let me play this a little bit. Okay. Oops. So uh, the result is a dynamic map that resembles a beating heart. This project uses data similar to traffic apps like Waze. But instead of creating a collaborative, useful tool, it faces the observer with a poetic image, the city as a living organism. It is a fine example that art can create experiences with data that can go beyond presenting information and actually remind us of our collective nature. The other artwork I want to share with you is, oops, is Shast by Brazilian artist researcher Malu Fragoso. Shast is an artistic project that proposes a housing system for homeless bees. It consists of three modules, a system that collects data from a real hive with active bees in a farm, a second connected empty hive in an urban forest to attract homeless bees that can be later moved to the farm, and the third module, the expository module, an art installation in which visitors can relate to artistic experiments inspired by the bees data. I had the chance to collaborate in this project by creating and coding the dynam dynamic visuals that reacted to data collected from the hive. This project uses technologies 
known as Internet of Things to create an insect machine human relationship. It discusses a growing complex concern that interplays social and environmental connectedness and relates it to urban development, food production, pollination, massive use of pesticides, and loss of biodiversity. Shast is a very experimental and artistic project that seeks connection with nature through data, but there are projects like Fruit Map, uh, a Brazilian collaborative application that map fruit trees in the city so everyone can find them. I discovered this app because a friend of mine that lives in Brasilia, our capital, uh, she showed me this app. Uh, she used to find pitangas, a typical fruit of ours, known as the Brazilian cherry. By using this app, she could identify which fruits were in season and where she could explore the city to get some free fruit. I just wanted to bring this example as a curious way to engage with the city's nature through data. One could engage by accessing data or by suggesting new trees and information. This collaborative approach is a kind of citizen-generated data and points a way in which ordinary people can take care of the city by sharing and consulting data on a daily basis. A great example of Brazilian group that is really into thinking uh, into thinking and experimenting this practice of political engagement is Data Lab. They are a data storytelling in Maré, a neighborhood and favela complex in the north zone of Rio de Janeiro. Data Lab was, the, was first started because they were not confident that the government official data fully documented the, rea the reality they lived in the favela. In order to produce journalism and engage people, they have several projects to promote a local culture. The idea is based in the development of social, social technologies with critical thinking. One of their projects is Coco Zappi, or Pupu Zappi, a citizen-generated data project about basic sanitation problems. What I think is important to say about Coco Zappi is that they don't use powerful algorithms or surveillance, surveillance systems but create a very important community project from a low tech and educational approaches. There is a WhatsApp number that a, person, that a person can send photos, address, and information about basic sanitation problems. They had to use WhatsApp as a matter of accessibility. So everyone can send content, even a person who, who can't write can send audio messages. So the most efficient way of collecting data is not the easier way for the team who is organizing the data, but it's, but it's based on a tool that is already used and known for most of the people. The last project I want to show to you today is Meu Rio Hackeado, an interactive installation that my studio, Ambus, developed for an exhibition in the Museum of Tomorrow. This was an exhibition in 2016. Let me just, okay. Uh, this, uh, this was an exhibition in 2016 that was entirely about citizens' initiatives in our city. They asked us to create an interactive installation in which the visitor could select a wish or a project he or she would like to join or initiate in their neighborhoods. We wanted to create a collective experience we decided to explicitly show the data so they could see they were part of something bigger as they were interacting. When the visitor started interacting, he or she would see how many people had already participated from how many neighborhoods. Museum of Tomorrow was very pleased to know it has received people from all of the neighborhoods in Rio. This project showed me how interactivity in public spaces like museums has great potential for active data experiences. Museums and cultural institutions are already spaces that foster an opening for interaction and therefore can be centers for social discussion. They are a great field for citizen-generated data and collaborative platforms. 
So throughout this talk, we saw seven possibilities of taking care of, taking care of or connecting to the city using data visualization or data art as a media to enhance social and environmental awareness. Exploratory data visualizations, poetic use of data through visual metaphors, telematic, artistic and experimental projects, collaborative apps to explore the city, social projects and citizen-generated data, interactive platforms in public spaces and museums. I hope these examples show, show data projects as a practice for creating the sense of community as a foundation for a caring city. The challenge of thinking about a caring city is the challenge of creating and enhancing the connectivity by inviting people to think and experiment daily with data and the city as a collaborative platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. That was wonderful. And, and a number of interesting examples of the types of data that can be used um, in interactive visualizations. Just a, a quick question um, before we move on to our panel. You talk a lot about public access and awareness to data, and obviously there are a lot of different ways that you can visualize it. Um, so this may be a broad question, but in your experience, how has the act of seeing data in novel ways of experiencing it as a living um, artifact or as a interactive exhibit, how has that changed the way that citizens feel about their data collection? Do you have any insight on that? Mm. I think uh, when you started, when you start to collect, actively collect data, you it, it's probably the first step for a lot of people to really engage with uh, citizen projects. So because it's a form of understanding, um, and visualize them can be a previous step for the first step. <laughs> so maybe. When you see this, uh, the first uh, example that I showed, for example, uh, the educational landscape, you, can, you could see that. And that, that experience inside the museum uh, really, really, um, really raised awareness of a social condition that actually most of the people already know. But seeing that, that was the, the quote for the, from the visitor that actually he became a friend of mine <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> um, because uh, seeing that was really powerful. It was uh, really different from uh, reading that news in a, uh, in, in a newsletter. So data visualization is um, um, a media for raising awareness. That's it. That is my point, actually. <laughs> Yeah, that's perfect. And I think we're going to, to return to that theme with the, the panels and talk a little bit about how data is viewed by different people, how it's understood. So thank you so much for opening us up with such a wonderful presentation. I will try to put some links in the chat, in the chat so anyone can further their, their research on that. <laughs> okay. Great. And we'd encourage all of our thank attendees. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We'd encourage all of our attendees who are interested in learning more about Barbara's platforms to get in contact with her. I know there's been a couple of questions specifically about your, your coding and your, um, your processing, so we'll let them get in touch directly. Thank Great. you, Barbara. Great. Thank so, you. so now it's time to move on to our, sec our first panel, um, which will be about the digitization of cities, specifically examples of how the world is approaching digitization uh, what policies have been implemented, and um, how is data collected. So with that, I, I'm pleased to present our first speaker, um, Fabro Stibel. Uh, Fabro wears many hats. He is a postdoctoral fellow that is associated with the Berkman Client Center here in Boston, as well as the executive director of ITS Brazil. He's also a member of the Global Council of the World Economic Forum. So we'll welcome Fabro to the stage and allow him to introduce himself. Welcome, Fabro. Hello everyone, um, really pleased to be here thinking about cities, especially in COVID times, is so important and so, and so urgent. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your background and yourself, please? Yes, uh, so my background is on open data, open government. I try to think about how we can put different stakeholders to collaborate. 
as executive director at ITS Rio, Institute for Technology and Society at Rio. We think up from the regulatory aspects, from the rights and technology sides, from the democratic aspects. Now we have elections in the US, we have some experiences of what it means. From innovation, trying to understand how we can use technology in the government to increase public interest without uh, endangering other, other privacy issues and on disinformation, how to fight disinformation and so on. Previously, I'm also affiliated to the Buckman Klein Center uh, in the World Economic Forum. I was in the future group on rights, um, human rights and technology, and I'm always thinking about cities and data governance. Fantastic. And we wanted to talk to you a little bit about your involvement in the Open Government Project in Brazil. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the country's focus on open data and database availability? Yes. So open government, it's a new concept. It starts around 2008 with Bet Novak and others. In 2011, the Open Government Partnership is created. Brazil is one of the founders, UK and US, others. Um, and then we start to think about what if we have this culture of open government? Open data was a hot term we used to use before, but what about open government? What do you think about transparency, about uh, participation and about accountability and the use of technology for that? So lots of countries has uh, uh, participate in the OGP. I believe right now it's around 80 countries, but they just increased the subnationals. We have several cities and states participating. There should be around 300 participants and they create an a open government plan. They have two years to, to execute that. Well, what are the key findings and what are the, it is related to data governance and, and cities? Well, first, we have this idea that um, different stakeholders should participate in the process. And then they have this type of participation where the first level is informed, but the fourth level and really important one is to collaborate. So you have different stakeholders with the government co-creating policies on open governments. Finland, for example, they have created uh, senior citizens for uh, evaluating uh, public policies. So imagine that every time you have a, a policy that might impact uh, senior citizens, they have a say and they have a say during the policy formation. Brazil has a huge expertise in participatory budgets and also in creating this participatory platforms where people can collaborate and discuss or internet view of law was created through the internet. But when you start to think about data governance itself, it becomes harder to address these issues. So UK have interesting experiences uh, on that. Argentina has interesting experience on that, but it's very tailor-made. So Argentina, for example, they have a plan on public spaces, especially uh, public city parks, while the UK have this idea of international exchange of data on uh, land uh, registry, for example. It's a topic that we don't know sufficient enough, but we know that without adding the component of governance on data, um, it's almost impossible to achieve innovation and privacy. Fantastic, thank you for that intro. And I know we're going to get more into the questions about what we do and do not know and, and how to approach those later when we go to the full panel discussion. And I know, uh, Fabro, you have a lot to say about that. So we're looking forward to having you come back up to the stage and talk during our open discussion. So thank you for the intro and we'll see you back here in a few minutes. Um, but first I'd like to introduce Ed Bunyon. Um, he is a professor of computer science at e the EPFL in Switzerland. His research is on data center systems and cloud computing, and he most recently has been involved in the development of a Google and Apple exposure notification framework. Ed currently serves on the National COVID Scientific Task Force of the Swiss government as the digital expert. So as is required in all meetings these days, we had to mention the word COVID, and I'm sure Ed can give you a little bit more detail on that. Um, and I'm gonna hand over the floor to you to introduce yourself. Welcome. Thank you very much. So yeah, so I live in, uh, in Switzerland. I used to live in the United States. It's actually a pleasure to be a resident of a country with stable, stable government and stable democratic processes, even though they're a little bit more boring than in the US. At least we have some stability. Uh, uh, my pleasure to be here, to be on this panel. Uh, my background is actually in data centers, right, which is actually the invisible part of your mobile phone. Your mobile phone is not that useful without a data center to manage all the data. And I spent probably the last 20 years really 
working on core technology to make these data centers more and more efficient. Never really worried about the applications that were using them, never worried about the data that was collected. And then through somewhat of an accident, I became involved in a completely different field of computing, which is uh, the use of phones uh, in the context of the pandemic. This is the first pandemic where we all have a phone in our pockets. And these phones are actually have massive capabilities. And my interest in data uh, and the relationship between data the public sector, um, the cities or the countries, and, and the citizens started with, uh, with this crisis when, quite frankly, everybody was approached from all sides to come up with tools to fight the pandemic. And if you put this back in perspective in around February of this time frame in Asia, when the pandemic was already rising, what we had is the emergence of some mobile applications that were incredibly intrusive where basically you open the kimono to the government from your phone, where to all the places that you have been to. And that basically in return gave you the right to take the train, right? as was the case in China, go from A to B. Uh, and this was sort of a, a case of, of very clear uh, supervision of and control of population using digital means, using both what's on the phone and what's uh, in the data center. And to make a very long story short, because we'll have the opportunity to talk about it, we ended up coming up with a solution, which is now part of the Google uh, operating system and part of the Apple operating system, which is deployed in uh, probably around 20 countries around the world, between 50 and 100 million phones, which uses Bluetooth to exchange information between people that are close to each other from a location perspective. Um, it actually doesn't depend on your actual physical location, but it's really the proximity that is being identified. And one of the key aspects of this protocol is that no data is centralized. So it's actually, rather than being about open data, transparent data, good data, bad data, this is a case of no data. And showing that you can actually create an interesting application because it serves a purpose, which is to communicate between people. Uh, people that were close to each other for 15 minutes four or five days ago and then one of those two people uh, who don't know each other just turns out to be sick with COVID. Uh, and you can build that through effectively a communication network and a protocol without having any form of aggregated data, which I think is, is interesting. And it maybe is a path to the future, which is we need to think about the data that we share, the data that we collect, and the ability for these phones to effectively, efficiently compute over very large data sets locally within the phone. A lot to think about there, and it leads to a question that I wanted to ask you. We had talked a little bit previously about centralized versus decentralized data, which is, of course, what you were just uh, touching upon. Do you think, given what you know about handling large data sets, that governments are prepared to centrally ha safely handle smart cities data? Or do you think that it's more realistic that we'll see more of this decentralized model that is perhaps uh, coordinated by the private sector? I think it's all a matter of the, the scale of the data, the sensitivity of the data, um, and what you actually do with it. Um, I mean, if you think about uh, the data that you might collect in the context of a safe city, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, just t you know, TV, right, Close CCTV uh, feeds, uh, the centralization of that information exposes you to a number of risks, uh, a massive number of risks, allows you to learn it allows you, for example, to, um, to go beyond the original mission that um, the, the system is, in play, is put in place for. One of the things that's very important with, uh, with computer systems at the scale that they can be deployed today is to think about the emergent properties of the systems at scale, but also to think about the feature creep that you can build, because there's always a tremendous temptation to use uh, additional data or to use data that was not intended for a particular purpose for another purpose. And I'll give one example, which I think fits into the context of safe cities, which is back in March, I mentioned the, the Asian story, where there was also a, a path that was being considered in Europe, which is to use effectively triangulation technologies from cell phone operators to basically localize people uh, and to localize mobility patterns of individuals at scale for the purpose of either measuring mobility or, to, or measuring contacts. And that's an example of effectively a, a, a creep 
where you go from effectively an existing infrastructure, which exists for another purpose, and you use that infrastructure for things that were not anticipated, which of course needs to be done with uh, appropriate regulation. Yeah, you bring up a good point that we need to think about unintended consequences when we're building systems. Um, and I think we'll be able to come back to that a little bit later when we have the open question and answer. But, but thank you for raising the point. Um, and we'll, we'll hear from you a little bit later. Uh, and so next, I'd like to introduce, introduce you to our third panelist um, on this first panel. Uh, Nabil Shakil Ahmed is uh, a senior program officer at Open North's advisory service. So he's coming to us with a Canadian perspective. Um, and they, Open North works with communities across Canada on their open smart city capacity building need, need, sorry, needs. Uh, Nabil, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Alicia. Um, really delighted to be here and to be sharing kind of some of the Canadian experience with smart cities uh, and uh, just to kind of provide some context. So Open North is one of the leading uh, not-for-profits uh, in Canada, uh, social enterprises that have a, has a background in open data and technology. We drive research capacity building and network collaboration across sectors uh, and within sectors to advance the responsible and effective use of data and technology. Um, and we have a pretty long track record in working in open government, open data. And in fact, we started off as an organization that produced uh, tools such as, you know, uh, a tool to track, you know, what is your parliamentarian doing, right? Um, and now we've moved more to a consulting kind of uh, model. And we're the lead technical partner of the Community Solutions Network, delivering an advisory service. So in that, and that's the context of my role as well, working directly with Canadian municipalities that are interested in using data and technology, interested in implementing and developing smart city initiatives and projects. Um, and this operationalizes our approach to smart cities, which we call an open smart city approach, which is intended uh, to be a counterpoint to the kind of often top-down techno-solutionist approach to smart cities. We're thinking about how can we have a values-based community-driven approach to smart cities to the use of data and technology that doesn't center the solution but actually thinks about what the problems are before we think about solutions. Um, so that's the kind of work that I've been doing over the last year and a half, working directly with cities across Canada, large, small, rural, urban, that are interested in thinking about how can we take advantage of the new tools that are available to us. Fantastic. And it's great to have a perspective from a country outside of the US and, and Europe, although Canada obviously is linked very closely to both. Um, so the, the question I have for you, so you mentioned that Open North focuses very strongly on the local to national or local to global model. Has starting out at the local policy level, um, has it helped create smart cities momentum in Canada? Has it improved adoption? And at you know where we stand today, what do smart cities in Canada really look like? Yeah, so I, I think uh, certainly we, what we've seen over the past year uh, and one of the reports that released was the state of open smart communities in Canada last year. But what we've certainly seen over the last year is communities in Canada have been learning from and looking at cities like Boston, New York City, San Francisco, Seattle, learning from what's happening there. Uh, and in fact, the federal government in 2017 announced a Smart Cities Challenge, which was actually you know, quite similar to the IBM Smarter Cities Challenge in the US. So there was interest, but it was adapted to a Canadian context, had a Canadian flavor. Um, you know, instead of being competitive, it was more collaborative. And, you know, there was, uh, and certainly with Sidewalk Labs in Toronto over the past two years, that served as a really powerful kind of example for other Canadian municipalities to think about okay, what is it that we want to achieve here? And that actually, the Sidewalk Labs um, kind of uh, project, which was in Keyside in Toronto, that opened up a broad public conversation, both in the city of Toronto, where people were looking at, okay, what's Amsterdam doing? What's Barcelona doing? Uh, what's Singapore doing? And how can we think about data governance and smart cities governance in that context? But it also served as a lesson, and I, I know this because I've been speaking to cities across Canada, city managers across the country said, okay, how do we not do that? How do we not kind of, you know, get the kind of, you know, really kind of fractious, you know, conflict that we saw in Toronto and how do we achieve community buy-in? Uh, and so I think 
certainly we've seen a lot of interest uh, from communities in learning from what's happening globally and, and for sharing the lessons across the country. So you can have some from the city of Edmonton, Alberta, who really wants to talk to you know, Montreal, Quebec, because they want to share the lessons. And that's uh, something that I think you know, we're part of and it's uh, been really exciting to see. Great, and I know there has been a lot of um, controversy over the, the Sidewalk Labs project in Canada, so I'm glad you brought that up, and I think we can probably return to that um, later. I think it, it would be hard to avoid. So at this time, we're going to invite our first two panelists back up to the stage and um, kick off some open Q&A. So I want to remind the audience that if you do have questions that you'd like to bring up to the panel, please insert them in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll do the best we can to get to as many of those as possible. Um, but it looks like everyone is back, um, so we can start with the question. And Eve, I was going to give you a chance to jump in as our commentator and see if you want to kick off the questions. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks to the panelists. I, I really love your, your, your perspective. I, I would like to, I have plenty of questions, but let's start with one question, which is somewhat to define what smart cities are for you, because we're using this, this nice word, and it sounds pretty cool, right? And uh, Nabil, you mentioned uh, there, are, there are some pushback. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm really interested to, to have the through, three of you somewhat defining, because I'm hearing on one hand, they're kind of very positive. It's cool. It's good for citizens. It's, and the other one, which other people are saying, yeah, but smart city is also about technology, which in a way it more and more undercover somewhat allow social control, right? So I'm interested to have a bit of a your sense. Uh, 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 how do you, the three of you, define somewhat what a smart city are and if they can be the famous caring city that we're talking about, please. Nabil, do we start with you? Uh, sure, uh, I, can, I can begin. I mean, to be honest, I mean, and you know, uh, what's fascinating for this question for me is also, I come from an academic background where I studied smart cities and this is a definite, this is a, one of those chaotic terms, right? There's a thousand different meanings of it. And I think the simplest kind of one simple kind of approach to it is, thinking about the use of data and technology, right? And in, in a city context, right? Now it can be for different purposes, for different needs. It can be for optimizing city service delivery. It can be for engaging residents better, right? It can be driven by the city government. It can be driven by residents. And I think, you know, what Open North has kind of thought about is the open smart city definition is one where all stakeholders are collaborating to use data and technology in ways that are environmentally friendly, that are socially responsible, that uh, respect the mandate of citizens uh, and local and preserve local democracy. That's the approach that Open North is trying to take and trying to you know, really reappropriate and redefine this term of smart cities and move it away from being a corporate vision of smart cities. Okay, so I will take a bold direction and I'll say that the smart city is about people. So I'll let you know how I, I met the favelas, the slums in Brazil, and how smart they are, and no technology digital involved. So uh, some, someone to, uh, brought me to um, uh, Barreira do Vasco, which is a, a slum in Brazil. And then when I arrived there, uh, the first person to arrive actually built uh, her house kind of one kilometer up the hill. And then she did the, the sewage, the, all the, the water passage, through her house and everyone that come after her kind of plug in in the water system there. Uh, you are hacking the system, right? Of course, this is not legal and so on. In another Islam I enter, if you see how the electricity is connected and how telco is connected, is a public-private uh, association. Uh, not official, of course, but someone buys the poles, another one hires the wire and so on. And all of this is smart. And usually we see this as illegal and so on, but this is smart. This is people connecting for an end goal. But when they release Pokemon Go, you cannot play in the favelas because there's no road in the system. So there's no Pokemons for you in the road and so on. So I think the smart city is how we understand the cities about people, connecting people, and use the technology for the end game of the city, for the public interest. I love technology, but the technology has roads, water, and so on, they must serve the people. And if the state uh, usually doesn't reach, people do the job. So smart cities for me is a place where the people and the governance of the cities and the stakeholders use technology in the interest of the people. I like it. Edouard, would you agree with that? Yeah, so I, 
I very much agree with it. And I think it's easy to actually exclude from the definition what is effectively simply catching up the bridge between the, the consumer experience that we have and the public sector experience or the enterprise experience, right? We all use our phones. We know we can do a lot of things with our phones. We can pay things with our bank for our phones very easily. And then at the same time, whenever we need to go through some very basic administrative process, we, some, we have the feeling that we go back uh, 10 or 20 years, right? So that's merely simply a question of bridging a gap. And, and that's not what people mean or people are expecting from a smart cities perspective. To me, the smart cities are the things that actually cannot be done in the analog world. And there are many, many things that cannot be done, that can be done relatively easily in the digital world once you assume this fabric that cannot be done at all, that don't have a, a transcription back into the old world. And that's, I think, is the most interesting applications. It's also the ones that needs to be thought through the most, right, of course. But these are the most interesting applications. And in many cases, we actually have, we, we can see cases where technology can help if it's well-designed, solve things that cannot be solved in the analog world. Yeah, the, the idea of access and connectivity brings up a question about how are we making decisions about what types of data is going to help the people? How are we, uh, our smart cities, how are they organizing around making these decisions? Is it a public-private partnership? Is it coming from the ground up? Is it elected officials? Do any of you want to share, I know Nabil, you're, you're nodding a lot because I think this is right down your, your alley. Do you want to share a little bit about what you're seeing around this decision-making? Yeah, I can I can maybe begin unless Edward you wanted to. No? Okay. I, I wanted to just say that this opens up, you know, the kind of topic of data governance, which is something that we're seeing many communities across Canada and around the world really think very carefully about. Um, I want to recognize that a lot of data has always been gathered in cities. Even before the use of mobile phones, we were already gathering data, cities were already collecting data, and we're already using it in various ways, good and bad, uh, especially in an urban planning context as well. You know, data has been used for, you know, not so good ends as well. It's been used to control and surveil populations for a long time. That said, and now we have the kind of, uh, the new world where a lot more data is being collected, it's being collected very quickly. You know, we have a, we're in the so-called world of big data, you know, and we have private sector actors who are also collecting data. So maybe, you know, Uber or Google know more about mobility data than city governments do. Um, and this kind of opens up questions for governments to think about who is collecting that data? How can we actually use that to drive value for our residents? How can we actually, you know, share that data amongst departments? How do we protect the, the privacy of residents? Uh, how do we ensure that data breaches don't occur, right? These are all questions that open up, um, you know, and there's questions of coordination among within the government, you know, because something that we see a lot uh, is even within a government, you don't necessarily, you can't take for granted that different departments are gonna be talking to each other. And you also, this opens up also the, uh, the kind of notion of multi-stakeholder collaboration. How is government going to be sharing data with, let's say, researchers or civil society, as well as public-private partnerships? How is government going to be sharing data with businesses? And finally, multi-jurisdictional. So how do different levels of government share data with each other? You know, in the, st in the states, for example, how are states and federal government and city governments sharing data with each other? How are different cities sharing data with each other? Uh, it's a whole web that I think, you know, we're we're looking very closely at, we're working, you know, we produced a report for the city of Toronto on data governance practices, and we're currently working with the city of Montreal on a project to support data collaboration amongst different stakeholders. And we're seeing that the real need for having a comprehensive holistic framework to think about data governance. Um, I can share more about that, but I'll pause because I could keep going for a while. Fabra, do you want to jump in and add? Yes, um, governance doesn't work. In general, we don't have the knowledge in society for 7 billion people to be governed. Uh, and this works for non-technology aspects as well. But in terms of technology, I think they're teaching us a lot about governance because a lot of the work, the human labor that needs to, for the governance 
the secretariat, the data processes, what can be done with the aid of technology. So two key words that um, we should keep around us. The first one is multi stakeholderism. This idea that different stakeholders, they do have different visions and they should participate. I'll give one example of this innovation, the opposite of innovation. Brazil just launched a policy for uh, innovation, the public, um, uh, a national policy for innovation. And in the governance of it, they excluded all the other sectors. It's very hard to promote innovation if you're just looking at the government, at the executive level, at the federal level. I understand how people have this idea that we must do something, but you should do something with mood stakeholders putting people together. And the second thing is something related in the, in the, um, the presentation that came before our panel, it's about crowdsourcing. So government should include opportunities, uh, processes for people to engage and participate, might be tasks that they can do. So governance is more about a process than the end result. Uh, and have these ideas of how governance works is something that is still building. Technology has helped us to advance really fast. 5G uh, is possibly one of the topics that uh, everyone is around, uh, TCP, IP, uh, generic top level domains. We do have some good ideas of how technology can teach us. But the truth is that uh, we don't know much. And I wonder, Ed, if you'd want to lob in a little bit about how data is handled, since that seems to be your, your background. What, what technological barriers are there to different municipalities or you know, even larger on the, the state level sharing information like this? Well, there's a, it's a question of critical mass. I think it's the, the, there's a lot of legacy. Uh, because a municipality went from effectively a pen and paper expectation to a computerized expectation. And they did that, like many, many organizations, in a way when, when it was suboptimal to make that transition. Right? If, if a municipality through some magic wand could have waited 20 years, not do anything, and suddenly digitize themselves, then it, it would look completely different than what it looks today. Uh, and that's obviously the, the beauty of a startup that comes out of nowhere and everything works magically and everything is well thought through and connected. That's because they're using state-of-the-art concepts and they can operate at scale. So in, in the business, it's called the technical debt, right? And municipalities, from their IT perspective, have a lot of technical debt, as all legacy organizations and municipalities, by definition, have been around for 100 years. They, they predate the digital era. So that, that's where I think there's a lot of challenges. It's very difficult to, to work together because you're, it, it, the systems that the municipalities largely use, and there I'm talking about the not smart cities part of it, simply the, the legacy aspect of, of the municipalities is very much constrained by these silos. Now, is there a way out of this? Um, well, the answer will completely depend on the notion of the sovereignty of uh, the cities, how much latitude they have. And in some countries, it's a very cultural thing. In some countries, there's tremendous decentralization and federation, which works great for many things and terribly for others. Others have a much more tradition of centralization. Um, or you end up having this situation that in the absence of any governance on how this migration happens, that simply the best possible non-governmental private sector solution ends up taking over, right? Um, it's actually quite phenomenal to see the use of cloud technologies for many things. Uh, and in a way, right, it becomes embedded into the normal process. And pretty soon, the, this legacy infrastructure may get subsumed by a sort of global multinational, pan-national sort of cloud infrastructure where, where things are not controlled in the same way. And of course, this is, that kind of transition has happened in the United States, which does not, for where there's no ambiguity in terms of systems of laws. It's not possible uh, in other countries, right, including in Europe, because of a lot of constraints. Uh, or it's, it should not be the case, and yet it's still happening on the back. So it's, it's an interesting transition. I don't expect this to change that fast. Part of it is also the, the education of our political class. Um, you know, being in tune with the digital world is, is still viewed as a curiosity if you're an elected official these days. 
there's a lot of parallels there between efforts to educate politicians on things like life sciences and then also on on big data. And I know from experience um, working in the U.S. government, a lot of the technology that it, they feel comfortable using is quite old. Um, for example, you'll buy a new computer and they'll put Windows from three versions ago on it because that's where the security is is known. Um, I wonder if you're seeing that in your various locations that the government players are reluctant to take on these new cloud computing technologies or anything that would be that would enable them to do smart city data automation more easily. So is there is there that hurdle or is that something that's um, perhaps only seen in a few sectors? Or maybe you haven't seen it all. <laughs> No, certainly I can maybe uh, kind of share what I'm seeing in Canada. There was a joke that was going around on Twitter a few months ago. You know, what are your drivers of digital transformation? You know, was it, uh, was it, you know, citizen demand? Was it, you know, kind of political will? The answer, the right answer is COVID-19 has forced everyone to like really transform their services and go online immediately because how else do you deliver services online? Of course, this raises the question that, you know, um, that Fabro and others have been discussing in the chat as well, like of the digital inclusion, of the digital divide, you know, where really a lot of people don't have access to technology. They don't have access to the internet. You know, in Canada, this is a huge issue. A lot of communities don't have access to broadband because they're so rural. Um, and yeah, I think we're certainly seeing a lot of appetite for using new technologies. Uh, the other joke that I saw just yesterday, actually, someone remarked, every community, every, every city, every, every government is implementing ERP systems. It's going to take 18 to 24 months and, you know, everything will be faster once they're done. And in reality, and Edward is kind of, you know, nodding, we know it never takes 18 months. We know it's never like a silver bullet to your problems, but they all want to do it, I think. And because they see there is huge... Um, you know, there, there's a huge opportunity to speed up services, to simplify service delivery. Uh, what it requires, however, what I think they don't always appreciate is it requires change management. It requires changing your processes. Not, you know, you can install a new software, but you can't force everyone to use it, right? And you can't force everyone to use it in a consistent way. That kind of change management is actually much tougher and takes a lot, lot more kind of energy and will, you know, I mean, we've seen examples of, for example, you know, when you speak to open data for, you know, you can have kind of communities, cities that say, yes, we'll release the open data. We'll kind of share how much we use the budget for. And then city staff will say, well, do you really want to share that data? Because it doesn't make it look so good, you know, and <laughs> it becomes a political battle inside the government to kind of share data or not. Uh, but I'll pause there and maybe Fabro and Edward might have other thoughts on this. Yeah, I well, I, w one of the most interesting forms of open data these days is, of course, the COVID-related data. And what's interesting about it is it is scrutinized, over-scrutinized. When you're deep about it, you can actually identify, using public data, very interesting trends, right? Contention in basic services, for example. Um, there are a lot of... E early leading indicators, and we've been doing a lot of that work actually to try to understand where we are on a day-by-day -day basis. And at the same time, and this is where I think the communication and the, the educational perspective is so important, um, the fact that data is public means that it could be misinterpreted by people that either have a malicious intent, right? But most often, the people that just don't really know what it means to actually deal with data. And the most obvious example that, that I want to give, and it's, it's a shocking example, and it's true in Switzerland, it is true in the United States. I don't know if it's true in Brazil. Um, it's true in many countries in the world. There are fewer people who get tested on Saturdays for COVID and Sundays, right? And, uh, and the tests get reported on the next day. So like clockwork, for the past six months, right? The Monday news report by the press reporter in Switzerland, right? The official, the equivalent of the Associated Press would have, you know, a headline saying fewer tests reported today. Every single Monday for the past 
four months, right? Until they stop reporting numbers on the weekend. And so the, the issue of, of transparency with data is that it can, it requires a level of sophistication and data without the interpretation brings us back to this well-known quote about statistics, which is lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can tell anything with the data. It doesn't solve um, any of the other problems associated with, with communication, and it doesn't solve the need. Trans transparent data does not um, eliminate, in fact, it creates more work to make sure that the communication with the people and the public is well thought through and well structured. Yeah, it is. Uh, to avoid this. Uh, great, great answer, by the way, on the chat. Yeah, to avoid right. this, uh, they, they did. But uh, sharing some sad news, not only good news. The thing is that the government was unable to count the number of deaths. And this is based on the digital identity system that is flawed. So basically, if you put lots of Excel tables together, it's really hard to know people that are unique or not. There might be data errors of all the sources and so on. So one thing that we learned with the COVID is the problem of not, not having a digital identity system. One that protects people, one that can promote interoperability, and one that can be used by users, by citizens, to access the data, to control the data. So for me, this is one of the large heritage of the COVID is how flawed the identity system is across the world, uh, in, in Brazil included. And one thing that people haven't noticed yet that it's applying Brazil, it's applying to you, it probably applies otherwise, is that you have the, the use of data based on the purpose you collected it. And usually for emergencies like COVID, the data you connected must be deleted after the emergency is gone. Uh, this means a lot of data that has been collected is not yours and you should not keep. It's just something that you must delete and people are not talking about it. And I will give you the, um, the absurdity of how this can be done. So when COVID started, uh, the federal government said, okay, we must pay welfare benefits. But how do you pay welfare benefits when one third of the people doesn't have a bank account and one third of the people doesn't have internet? So, and you cannot move away from home. So let's use an app to pay in the bank account. This was the solution. Um, of course, this was a massive problem because you have to pay benefits for 70 million, 70 million people. And then uh, they selected a public bank to do it. The public bank did a good job uh, as much as possible within this context that was chaotic and so on. But this is what happens. You created 40 million bank accounts for citizens. And then uh, three months after that happened, the government said, mm, maybe we should privatize it because this is something that the market might have an interest on in that. And they say, no, no, you're doing all wrong. Like uh, <laughs> you cannot keep the data. The purpose of the data is to uh, increase access to banks, increase access to welfare, but not to become a product. And this is interesting about COVID because we have created lots of products out of COVID, but there's a flow in the data you should not use the data because of the emergency-based data. And second is, uh, we have to be really, to, to regulate and to be really protective that the purpose of the COVID emergencies and the um, data government that we adopted, which was that, that no governance, let's do it, uh, must not be forgotten after the emergency, otherwise uh, inequality in, inequality out. So interesting. May I just uh, uh, inter intervene as, as commentator? I have a question for, for the three of you listening to you. And it's a mix between participation. Fabro, you said that at the beginning, really, the need to bring the people in the dis discussions. Edouard, you talk also about when, when the tools are well designed. Yeah, the question I would ask by whom, right? Not just by the technicians on the expert, but with the people. And at the same time, you talk about the lack of education, right? Uh, uh, not just of the people, but also of, of, the, of the leaders. And I, I really try to see how do we combine these two elements when we talk about data, when we talk about uh, uh, talking about COVID-19, I mean, just all these kind of questions. And I, I really would like to hear you about this tensions between participation, bringing the people really on board, and at the same time, the lack of education. And I think, Edouard, I'm, I'm, I'm told, like you, I'm, I'm totally stunned by the, the fact that right now our leaders, uh, in, including in, our, in, in, let's say, around the world, have really no clue or very li limited understanding. So how, will, how, do you, how do you see 
uh, the connections between the gap. And maybe we, if we can start with you, Fabro, because you brought really the question of participation. I'm, I'm really interested. And then maybe uh, Edouard and, and, and Annabelle. Uh, no, this is an excellent question. I will go back to the, to the issue of design, what to design something for. So uh, Barbara showed a, a, a map in, of Rio that you see people who has a degree and people who doesn't have a degree. And then you see that you have more education in some areas and less education in others. But when you look at the contagious of COVID, the, the, the regions with more education, they are more contagious than the areas with less education. Um, and this have this idea that education is not about how, uh, necessarily how much school you have or how much education, but what you design in the process to counter that education. There's a good joke that it, um, I, I won't tell it all, but basically a doctor should not be good in defining how police works. Police should not be defining how restaurants work and restaurants should not be good in defining how doctors work. So the design of the system have to have this minimal level of education of capacity you need to participate and you should design for users, not for what you need. It's, it's a middle ground. So when you think about designing these participation systems, we have to be smart and saying, okay, what I want to achieve? Well, I want people to inform me about COVID cases. So what is the best way to do it? In Brazil, probably means to use WhatsApp, but also means to use crowdsourcing. You must consider that 60% of the people doesn't have education or, uh, of, or health and so on, or uh, and money and high level money for, for mobiles and so on. So it always comes back to the design. There's the issue of who uh, defines it. And this is why the participation is so important because if you have one of the stakeholders, the who becomes very limited to have a different views. But it comes back to the, how we design the system for our purpose. And the place where it always starts is the government. Because the government is by definition what we created to take care of us. This is for public interest. This is why I create the nations, constitutions, and so on. So I think the government must set the example and must set the leadership. But private sector has also did wonderful uh, ideas and wonderful innovations. I'm not making generalizations, but I'm saying that this advance in participation is a test for all, and the end game is public interest. This is, uh, this is what participation is all about. Edouard, your, your, your take on that? So, you know, maybe, maybe the, I think the, 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 you know, this is the, the reason why this is such a hard problem is because we've been talking a lot about data and we have not mentioned or talked that much about information, right? And the observation is data is going through an exponential growth and that is true across the board. It's also true when it comes to any form of municipal type data, right? Survey data, you know, satellite imagery, very high precision things land registers, whatever, everything that is used to exist is often a matter of public record as a matter of law, but then suddenly becomes data that's available. Right? Now that data itself is, is effectively, can be relatively innocuous, and there's a tremendous amount of data that is incredibly sensitive, that is actually never accessed because it's not tied to a piece of information. Right. And where things become a little bit difficult is when suddenly something goes from being relatively cold data, something that exists but that nobody cares about, to suddenly becoming some piece of viral information. Right? And information is something that actually rests in part on existing data. And the classic way we sort of try to explain the difference between the two is when Michael Jackson died, right, the fact that he died is information. Right? And that is it, the reason people use this example is because it's one of the most, you know, highest impact of sort of viral communication right, over the world. Now, because he died, suddenly everybody got interested in what he had done. And so suddenly this entire data set of things about the history of Michael Jackson becomes relevant for a week and then we move on to the next thing. And, and when you, if you think about the data that belongs to people, that are not public individuals, right? Michael Jackson also has a right to privacy perhaps, or not, that's not, that's not the point. But the common person who has a right to privacy, who is operating effectively, completely anonymously, actually has a lot of private data that may actually exist as cold passive data that suddenly could be promoted to, to a piece of information. And this gap, this promotion gap, I think is not, it's difficult to, um, to, to develop an intuition for. It's difficult to regulate 
right? Because a, a, a rational, you know, absent a strong set of guiding principles, people will say, well, you know, that information is not super sensitive, right? Why would, you know, is it that important or that secret that, for example, you know, you know, you, we used to have the phone book, right? People go back to it. Well, in the days of the phone book, right? You could tell where somebody lived, right? You could tell, I mean, most people had their addresses, right? You had their phone number, it was in the phone book. Uh, of course, that's because it was it was it was data that was not accessible in an interesting way. It would it was not promotable to information um, on a social scale where it could actually impact the privacy. That's why a lot of these privacy laws, right, were also defined in, are being redefined in the new era is because of this this information sensitivity, and and the the implication goes back to the governance of the information system that people are trying to develop for smart cities is how do you factor it in so that you can control information. Are we also seeing questions of generation gap? I'm just asking that because we were just recently discussing at the Berkman Klein Center, we were reflecting about education and surveillance and, and, and one of the message was also, mm, there is really a generation gap about understanding what are we talking about. Uh, 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 on one hand, you have the teacher, you have the system, you have uh, even the parents and, and then the the, the student and there's maybe really a generation gap in in uh, in understanding some of the issue that yeah, that you you just put on on the table as well. What do what do you think, uh, Nabil, about the generation gap, if any, trying to understand the question of participation and education? I think there's certainly an education uh, a generational gap. Uh, that said, you know you where you will see and this kind of like speaks to kind of what Edward was saying as well. You know many political uh, officials may not appreciate kind of, you know, how data information, data information communication technologies have transformed the landscape. I think, however, they are beginning to, and many, you know, and we're seeing, you know, as time goes on, the generations will change. I think what we're also seeing, however, is also an ideological gap. I think we see kind of, you know, some people who believe in privacy from a certain perspective and others have a very different perspective on privacy. Some people think that data should be sold, for instance. Others don't, right? Um, and I think this, I mean, what we're really grappling with at a broad societal level, you know, is this question is, is, is you know, the need to understand these new, the new reality that we live in, new systems that requires broad-based digital literacy, not just, so that's the kind of term that we use often, it is not just digital literacy and data literacy for, um, you know, staff or, politicians, but also for community members, because how are they going to, for example, provide their input on the use of sensors in the streets or the installation of cameras uh, on the pub in public squares if they're not able to understand how that data could be shared? Um, and actually, I mean, I can use like an example from my own home. You know, my brother, for example, he uses a smart home device. He uses one of those. I think it's a not an Alexa, but you know, he uses one of those smart speakers. He can say hello and you know, they turn off all the lights and he says, well, they already have my data anyway. You know, I don't have, I don't have anything to stay private. And I think what, maybe what I would try to say to him that, you know, he still has trouble understanding is, it's not about your data as an individual. It's about the aggregate of the data that is being collected that enables profiling and advertising that is profitable, right? Which also opens up as governments, for example, through contact tracing apps, collect large quantities of data that opens up, you know, new possibilities that were not, um, you know, that could not be envisioned before. Uh, and this is actually is an issue with digital identity systems as well, right? They can certainly have uh, a lot of value, but I think they open questions of digital rights. But what I would bring it to and, you know, Edward mentioned, for example, the GDPR is an example, right, of, you know, how a law that's trying to protect, um, you know, rights and, and actually enshrine new rights, you know. So, for example, the phone book, someone could, you know, say, I don't want to be in the phone book, right? Now through the GDPR, potentially someone could say, I actually want my name to be removed from the phone book. I want my name to be removed from the database and the records. These actually are not just digital rights, they are demo democratic rights. They're questions not just of like my personal privacy, but about like democracy in a community. And I think that is the challenge that we're facing that, you know, across generations as well, you know, that not all generations think about systems from that perspective, from that lens, and think about 
the future maybe, right? Maybe some people are very excited about technology and they think about, wow, I could do this. I can do something now that I could never do 20 years ago. It's exciting. But I think a conversation about data, digital rights and smart cities is a conversation about the future. Not just about the future of the technology, it's about the future of the city. And that's why we need to have, you know, different generations as part of that conversation. But for them to be a part of that conversation, you need to engage in broad-based public digital literacy. I think we're actually going to get into a little bit of that in the second panel, because I know that was a topic that came up when we were preparing for this. And one of the, the things that we talked about, um, and again, we'll get into it more, is the balance between what you're calling digital literacy or, or sort of personal um, agency and the responsibility of the government to protect people who maybe don't have the means to or the inclination to really understand the consequences of the choices they're making. And so I think GDPR is a really good example of a hybrid between that where the, the consumer needs to have some information but it's really actually quite difficult as a consumer to understand what exactly you're signing off on, even under GDPR. And I know, Fabro, you had mentioned something that you wanted to talk a little bit about the balance of GDPR and, and the Freedom of Information Act. So maybe this would be a good time to jump into that dichotomy and, and see, you know, where is the government kind of putting us at risk versus where are they trying to bring us into the loop of protection? Yeah, this is... Um... Uh, I think everyone remembers here, so I have seen a book list. So book list was this huge books that they printed and live in your home. In the 80s and 90s, you've seen the movies. So, um, when we printed, when we created these books, we were not aware of data protection. So we list your phone number, your name, your address, but we never thought this could be misused uh, against you. Uh, now we understand that this has been used for cybersecurity flaws, that uh, this is a huge issue for privacy and so on. Why is it related to innovations, GDPR, and Freedom of Information Act? Because we set uh, FOIA laws to be, uh, the default is to be public. So privacy of a document is the exception, not the rule. This is massive for government. This is really important. But we're still understanding how we can be in the 80s of understanding of privacy. So uh, I'll give you one example. So Congress passed a law saying that everyone that reserves this kind of welfare should be listed in the website. And then, okay, uh, government compliance and publish. Later on, we find out that for uh, this information has been used to restrict access to credit to people. So I know you receive welfare benefits. That said, my algorithm defines that you should have less access to credit. This is bizarre, but this is kind of the, the understanding we are having right now. Get, for example, a judiciary. Uh, when internet is started, we have HTML. HTML, you write the page. So you see, here's go the header, here is Fabro, here is go the and so on. So personal data and everything you need for the framework of the page was together. And then we split that. The judiciary hasn't done that. When you write a decision, basically write Fabro who lives here, has the these and that and that. When you publish a document, there is no technology to split what is private data, personal data, and what is um, uh, anonymized data. So we're still in the early stages of understanding all that. And we want governments to be more transparent. We want information to be shared for creating businesses and so on. But we haven't really understood how freedom of information law and privacy law go together. Uh, we are slowly trying to understand and setting standards on how to move forward. But the, the, the starting point is really, really fuzzy. I know, um, Nabil, you're also talking about open data in, obviously, at Open North. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I think one of the things that we've seen is there is a huge upsurge of interest in open data over the past few decades, uh, there has been a bit of a backlash to that. And I think there is a move towards publishing with purpose. So also identifying what data sets you want to publish and then also recognizing that some data sets are closed and should be closed for certain reasons, uh, which you know maybe doesn't quite, you know, I, I mean, this was actually, a again, an ideological and philosophical debate within the open source and open data movements over the last few generations as well, you know? Um, 
considering kind of where's the funding coming from, what data is it, how should it be used. But I, and I think uh, what we're seeing is, and, and I think we've also seen that, you know, data, to publish data on its own is inadequate. You actually need to think about the capacity to use that data, communities that can actually have access to the data, you know, there are open data standards that the International Open Data Charter kind of, you know, uh, speaks to as well. Um, but we've seen that, you know, open data was, an, was a necessary but insufficient step in the direction of transparency and accountability that, you know, was part of the vision of open data advocates. I wonder if any of you have considered the angle of health data where there's already very strict um, uh, privacy laws put into place and, and how that can be utilized for smart cities because obviously you know the favelas have different needs than say uh, Toronto would have and, and but there's all the same privacy concerns how how are you seeing um, in the US HIPAA compliant data being used and, and where are the challenges there that maybe could be transferred to some of the other sensitive data mm. Go ahead. Go? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to happy to go there. Um, so I, I think the ultimate test may emerge uh, in a few weeks or a few months once we start having broad um, virologic, virological testing or um, vaccine that we can attest to. Um, interesting example in uh, Slovakia, where basically they uh, they did a sort of a broad, uh, they're working on a broad, um, you know, massive sweep test of their population uh, currently under lockdown. And the promise or the premise is that if you test negative on a rapid test, even though they're not particularly sensitive, then you have more rights, right? You can go, I don't know, I'm not sure what the rights are, right? Let's say you can go to the restaurant, right? Uh, what the interesting aspect is that the certificate you have is a piece of paper. Um, and it's not an insane choice, and it's certainly not the choice of a tech, of a country that is not comfortable with technology. Slovakia is perfectly comfortable with technology. Um, I now I don't know the story behind it, but it's an interesting, um, I think, example that sometimes when you think about the potential emergent use of data after the fact, you have to be extremely careful with what you what you centralize in a database and what you don't centralize in a database. And, and if, you, if you think about the, you know, the, to me, the ultimate test to sort of, the ultimate case study to explain why we need to be careful of, of unanticipated consequences, which is also, I think, the ulti, the, the, an ideal test or a great test to identify whether people get the digital, their, you know, on which side of the digital divide they are with respect to their leaders is, people who understand the emergent property that Cambridge Analytica, Analytica exploited to, that led to micro-targeting of ads, right? It's a classic example. You can explain what happened. It's well understood by now. It's a three-step explanation. You can explain to some people who get the digital world and within five minutes they go, oh yeah, I get it, right? And then you can explain the same thing to people that are perfectly well-educated with advanced degrees five times and they'll still never really get it. And so I think that, that we, need to be, we need to be particularly careful when it comes to health data, right? The emergent properties associated with health databases are very massive. We also have to be uh, aware of the absolutely massive potential of the new continuous monitoring devices, right? So today, our, our relationship with the medical world is still very much rooted in the old days where a physician has to be near you for to collect anything right it's either either the doctor or a technician has to be near you to collect something of use right uh, and the reality is you can you know with bracelets and other health gadgets you can actually move to a continuous monitoring of people with very interesting predictive capabilities which, by the way, right now are completely done on a, on a global scale basis, uh, completely outside of any national framework, uh, not considered health data in many cases, when in fact it is. 
And so I think the notion that health data is regulated and starts and, and has the appropriate boundary condition may actually be a false premise. It may be a premise that, that dates the day where basically we were not talking about the digital transformation, we were simply digitizing our analog processes. That's incredibly fascinating. And, and I think actually a good place to stop to leave people to ponder because we are at the, the time limit. Um, but you know, a key takeaway, it seems from this panel is that the link between, as I think Ed said, data and information is not always clear. And in making decisions about the future of smart cities, the future of data usage, collection, storage, dissemination, you need to think about potential um, uses of that data that we haven't thought about and how it can be transferred into inter information at a future time. So we'll, we'll leave you with that example that I just gave of um, our, our steps per day becoming dangerous um, information to have against us and um, we're going to, to end the panel here. Um, but just for a, a run of show, you know, I want to thank the panelists who, who've been here so far. I think this was a fascinating discussion. It really set the stage for us to think about the future. Um, we're going to take a four minute break so that everyone can stretch for a minute and uh, we won't record it so there will be no personal data, but please do take a minute to walk around stretch and we'll start again at the 30 minute mark. So 1230 if you're in the US, 230 um, and 630 I believe. All right. Thank you everyone. Much appreciated.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all took the opportunity to stretch a bit. Uh, we're ready to start with our second panel. Uh, this is going to focus more on the impact of the individual and less on governance than the first uh, panel did. So we'll look at the individual and collective impact of collected data in cities, what potential benefits come with greater access to personal information, and where there are challenges to equity and privacy. We have a very diverse panel for this, um, a lot of different perspectives. And again, we've chosen people to represent the perspective from around the world. So first, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Veronica Barassi. Uh, Professor Veronica Barassi researches and writes about the impact of data technologies and artificial intelligence on human rights and democracy. She is an anthropologist and a professor in media and communication studies in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland as well as a chair of media and culture in the Institute of Media and Communication Management. Veronica also, I should mention, has a fascinating TED talk about the creation of the datafied citizen starting in youth. Uh, so check it out if you get the opportunity, but Veronica, the, the floor is yours and welcome. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Hi, first of all, I want to thank you to, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. And I was sitting at the other panel and I found it very, very interesting. Uh, so thank you. Um, I wanted to, uh, I, I don't want to take too much time to um, share my thoughts because I, I'm very uh, much looking forward to our discussion. But I wanted to start with some ideas uh, um, that I've been uh, working on, especially with reference to um, unbreaking and uh, deconstructing the idea of data as a big umbrella term, right? So when we think about uh, data in the city, we are actually talking about an extraordinary complexity of data forms. So we're talking about uh, data gathered through digital uh, surveillance, uh, data gathered through intelligent transport systems, emergency responses, data collected by welfare services, real estate data, data for urban design, smart parking, predictive policing, data gathered by both private uh, companies and public companies. Uh, also, or also we are talking about data, as we've seen with the keynote, data gathered for activism and for solidarity networks. And again, we're talking about um, health data and different forms of data. So, um, and I think that this is something that we really need to be aware of uh, when we think about uh, data in the city, especially if we think about policy and what we can do to make sure that um, we, we create cities that care, right? And um, so, um, when uh, one of the big questions that emerges when we think about uh, uh, this data complexity is, uh, of course, the tension between uh, private and public actors in the um, in the gathering of this data and the processing of this data and the sharing of this data. Uh, we're also thinking, we, we also have to think about uh, uh, how specific tech companies have monopoly over public spaces in many ways and how this uh, is uh, shaping our cities. Um, and, uh, but also one uh, fundamental question that emerges is uh, what's happening at the moment with COVID-19 um, and how cities can respond to this. Um, because what we have seen, it's actually a, a, an acceleration and a uh, speed in uh, uh, embracing uh, data technologies or technologies of surveillance uh, in public domains. So we have seen it also in the previous, uh, um, in the previous uh, um, panel. Um, and, um, and I think that in the newness and complexity of this, uh, we have the moral responsibility to actually engage in a public debate uh, on the human rights implications of all these technologies and on the ways in which uh, they are affecting weaker communities, uh, but also on the systems in place that we have to protect us and to protect uh, uh, weaker communities, right? And one way I think we should start this debate is by uh, considering two aspects when we think about data um, in the city. The first aspect is the fact that now, as we've seen, that data is being used to produce knowledge about cities. We identify areas of risk, areas of, uh, I don't know, real estate investment. We identify, we create knowledge about what the city is. But often this uh, knowledge is uh, the product of uh, um, human understanding and data that many times is not accurate or is uh, uh, biased. 
So uh, we have to acknowledge the biases and inaccuracies of, uh, of uh, this uh, knowledge that we produce about cities, of this uh, visualizations that we produce about cities. And we have to uh, make sure that uh, we put uh, um, processes in place to, uh, to highlight uh, the biases and the inaccuracies. Uh, but the other thing that we have to need and to need to consider if you really want to talk about uh, critically about the data in the city is to consider how data is often used to profile citizens and make data driven decisions about them. And uh, my understanding is that uh, one of the big misunderstanding of our times is the idea that uh, personal data is about individual privacy and it's about individual. But actually, uh, and that we have to protect personal data. But actually, when we look at how the way in which personal data is used, most of the times personal data is not really only personal. We are being constantly surveilled, constantly tracked, constantly analyzed, not only with reference to our own individual behavior, but with reference to the groups that we belong to. And this is particularly problematic when we think about uh, uh, marginal communities. This is why we're seeing in uh, um, critical internet studies, critical data studies, and in many different disciplines, we are seeing a lot of scholars coming forward and discussing uh, the large uh, social inequality implications of the data-driven systems that we are establishing. And for instance, like Madden and Al, which uh, uh, wrote an article in 2017, I think they really got it right because they talked about how poor and marginalized communities are often exposed to a networked privacy arms because uh, they are held liable for the actions of those that are in their networks and they are in their neighborhoods. So when we talk about the city, the city is also about the social inequality and how we create uh, systems to protect uh, uh, marginal communities. So this is something that we have to take into account. Um, and uh, so, and here I'm concluding. So what I think is that uh, as a debate, uh, we need to really consider cities that care and, to, and develop a politics of care. And the way in which I understand the politics of care is a politics that actually takes into account uh, the, the complexity and difference of data technologies in our uh, cities. And that places a particular focus on technologies that are oriented towards human profiling and making data-driven decisions about humans that can, act, can have an impact on civic rights. And so I think that this technology should be understood as high risk. I also think that we need uh, to intervene uh, and create public databases of all the errors and the biases, uh, not only of all the algorithms that are, um, the, uh, that are used in the city, but also of all the errors and biases uh, that, uh, we, uh, that emerged in data governance uh, in the city. And the other thing, the other two elements that I see fundamental in the politics of care of the city is uh, to protect vulnerable communities by ensuring uh, that, that we acknowledge the biases and inaccuracy in algorithmic predictions, but also that we put in place real human oversight and a transparent process of appeal. Um, and, the all, and the last one is, and has been said before by the, by the panelists before, is that we ensure that the data that is collected in the city uh, is deleted uh, after it's been collected uh, and it's been used for the purpose in which it's been collected. And that is not shared in a way that could actually follow citizens across the lifetime. So this, this was. Thank you. That was, that was a comprehensive overview of, of the factors <laughs> that I think we, we do need to think about. And I wanted to, to come to you with a question that we had talked about previously and came up in the, the last panel, which is about this idea of individual responsibility um, versus policy and the kind of collective protection. And you just touched upon the fact that there are, there's personal data and then there's collective data that is also personal to a subpopulation of people. So when we talk about transparency of data, is that enough? No, uh, I am actually, so I've been working uh, on my uh, recent project, well, the last project, which was called Child Data Citizen, and it was uh, a pro an anthropological pro project in uh, London and Los Angeles uh, on uh, uh, how families are dealing with datafication. And what I actually realized is that uh, if you look at us, many of us don't have the time or the scope or, you know, and even the dedication to read all the privacy policies that we have, should be reading uh, to understand what's happening. And even if we have the time, we have the time in an ideal world, um, which obviously is not, but um, the problem is that we do not have a choice. 
So an example that I use uh, very often is like, I personally don't have a choice. Even, even though I've been studying this, uh, the process of uh, datafication of childhood, I most of the times don't have the choice, but I have to sign the terms and conditions to ensure that my children do online learning or that my children have access to a play group when they see their, their friends uh, across the across the window. So I had, the, and I've been documenting all the same instances of what I define as cursed digital participation. This idea that digital participation is voluntary is no longer real. Actually, we are often forced to comply with regulations and to sign off our data when we comply with regulations. So, uh, I think we need, uh, we need uh, policymakers to acknowledge that. Yes, particularly relevant in this age of digital learning. And uh, unfortunately, the, the pandemic forces us into a lot of Google Classroom situations. So <laughs> a very important point to make. And I think we can come back to some of that later, because obviously it's a passion and, a, and an important um, piece of information to consider. So we'll, we'll move on to the next panelist, but then we'll welcome you back to, to continue with the Q&A. And I encourage our audience to think of questions for Veronica. Uh, so our next panelist is Greta Byram. Uh, Greta is the co-director of Community Tech in New York at the Digital, Equitory, sorry, Digital Equity Laboratory at the New School for Social Research. She's also a co-founder of the Community Tech Collective. Greta Byram builds digital justice through applied research, popular education, partnerships, and policy strategy. She's been influential in extending community efforts to expand Wi-Fi access, most notably through her work on New York's Resilient Communities Program. So with that, I'd like to welcome Greta to the stage and the floor is yours. Hi there, thanks so much for, um, Alicia. And it's great to be here with you all today. Um, so I wanna, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, kind of open up the field that we're working on with a couple of foundational questions. And the first one I wanna just lob out there is, um, a question about sort of the assumptions we make about um, big data. And um, I just want to point out where we are today, which is that for the second time in eight years, we've seen a massive failure of um, data driven polling in the US. Um, and it's had a material impact on um, our election and, you know, people's behavior at the polls. And I want to just, um, you know, ask the question of, you know, we sort of take as an assumption that, you know, we are in this era of big data and that we're moving into algorithmic decision making as a model of governance and um, just ask a question really um, of how, how real that is and how wise it is given, you know, the failures that we're seeing, um, you know, and I think um, I've done a lot of work also on the decennial census in the United States, and we're seeing a pretty massive failure there as well um, around, um, you know, moving the census onto the internet in an era when um, at least a quarter of U.S. households don't have internet at home, which might have been offset by um, public libraries really stepping up as data collection points. Um, however, with the pandemic, most of them had to shut their doors as well. And so now we're heading into a situation where um, the kind of data failure that we're seeing around the election um, is deepened by the way that the census is going to favor, um, it's going to favor white wealthy people um, over those who are disconnected, who don't have internet at home. And that's going to then shape the electoral map for the next 10 years. So, you know, before we just sort of assume that we're going to enter that future and we're going to become more algorithmically governed and that we're going to rely on data modeling to make huge decisions about our future, I want to just say, you know, we're that's maybe building upon a uh, fundamental infrastructure that is somewhat shaky. Um, so, as Leisha has said, a lot of my work is around sort of the fundamentals of um, connectivity. And um, certainly what we've seen, you know, with the pandemic is that we're seeing, um, you know, massive 
just realization that this problem of the digital divide is absolutely not solved. And in fact, um, you know, it, we're in a much worse place than um, sort of where a lot of people thought we were. Um, it, it became like a less attractive sort of proposition for policymakers and funders to really um, put money into infrastructure as a public good, um, as a shared utility. Um, and so much of the funding that's gone into infrastructure in the US for connectivity has gone towards massive telecommunications companies which have failed to serve um, a large proportion of the US population. So what I do is um, try to really rethink that fundamental infrastructure and where is it going wrong and, and what else could we do um, to create connectivity as a public good. So, you know, as I said, more than a quarter of US residents do not have internet at home. I think that number is pretty shocking. I mean, it may be actually closer to a third, um, it's depending on whose data you're looking at. In the US, we also have the problem that our data on connectivity is terrible. Um, the federal government does a bad job of managing it. And Microsoft, in fact, um, estimated that the numbers of people without internet at home are much higher, and especially without broadband speeds. Um, you know, this is based on sort of past dependency and the way that industry has held a natural monopoly on the backbone infrastructure in the US and the choices that they have made about um, investing based on return on investment and that being sort of their sole metric for um, decisions about infrastructure build out. Um, and so that we get to this situation where, um, you know, this is a map of Cleveland in 2017 and the green areas have their fiber optic service, the high speed broadband service and the pink areas um, do not and they're the, the parts of the city that are in poverty. So you take a look at this map, um, you know, consider that the people that live in those pink areas are using copper DSL old phone lines for internet, which if you've ever used that, um, which you probably did maybe 15 or 20 years ago, um, you know the speeds and you know that it may go out when it rains. Um, so compare that to this map. This is the Federal Housing Authority back in 1940 when digital, well, when redlining was a practice in the US where investors were literally um, instructed not to invest in areas um, that were, you know, these pink areas that were literally redlined on the maps um, by the federal government. And these ended up, of course, being the areas where uh, low-income people, people of color were living. So just compare Cleveland's um, digital redlining map to the 1940s uh, physical redlining map. And, and that's really where we are in the US is that there's a path dependency that brings us back to um, you know, what was a policy that was based on um, race um, pretty explicitly, uh, racial um, uh, privilege and um, discrimination is, is now just based on return on investment, but essentially as an economic policy has the same outcome. Um, so what, you know, what I and partners and allies, what we've been doing is um, trying to rethink this map and take these areas where that have been really underinvested in terms of basic infrastructure and work with the residents of those areas to build um, local infrastructure. Um, and so I can go into more detail about what that looks like. Um, you know, obviously it's a sort of difficult and long-term <laughs> proposition, um, but there's a lot of ways in which right now, uh, because uh, policymakers in the US are um, really understanding the depth of this problem that we are, um, you know, starting to look for new models of um, internet provision. And within that, you know, I think um, I wanted to just shout out um, Fabro, who was talking about governance on the first panel. Um, when people start to build their own telecommunications infrastructure, um, they think a lot about governance and questions about data and how it's managed and stored and shared um, become really relevant to how folks are, you know, provisioning this basic infrastructure. Um, 
Yeah, so we've been doing this now for about um, almost 10 years collectively between New York, Detroit, and a couple of other places. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's been really interesting is seeing people start to think about um, kind of the possibilities around data and how um, as we move into an era of really thinking about um, the revenue models that emerge from new kinds of services that are like sort of smart city models, which smart city is really just an amalgamation of different types of digital tools. Um, the higher up the food chain that um, local communities are in this, in terms of ownership of infrastructure, the more that they can be producers and not just consumers um, or customers when it comes to digital services. So that's really the, what we're proposing and I will leave it there for now. Thank you, Greta. I, just really quickly, because I think we'll get into this a little bit later, you mentioned the example of um, connectivity helping us to get a more accurate census in the U.S., which of course plays into our political um, voice. Are there any other um, particular outcomes that connectivity will help improve across, let's say, the poverty-stricken population? I mean, <laughs> like, there's a lot, yes. days, right? Like, I mean, you, you can't get an education now unless you're online. Mm -hmm. Like, so we're, we're talking about a category of basic rights um, that, you know, it's, it's really, you know, one might say this is unprecedented that like we have, we must think of internet as a utility because it's unprecedented that education has moved online, but you know, in reality, if you were doing, trying to do anything like get educated or get a job or access social services or anything, like you pretty much have needed to be online for a while. Um, but I think, you know, aside from just access to, you know, the absolute basics of participation in civic life and the economy in the 21st century, um, you know, folks are doing things like yeah, definitely doing um, innovative data sharing and um, data trusts. Um, they're doing things like air quality monitoring. Um, they're doing things like um, building local archives. There's a lot of questions about like, to what extent do we really have to rely on cloud services all the time or internet platforms that are like cloud, cloud hosted as opposed to um, localizing some of those services with, you know, um, local ride sharing that, you know, you don't have to send a message to a, a data farm in California somewhere in order to arrange a ride with your neighbor, right? So if we, if we think of network infrastructure a little bit differently and maybe more on the, the lines, along the lines of like a microgrid, that might change the, the sort of infrastructure, the larger infrastructure. So we're sort of doing like a proof of concept to, to ask, you know, to what extent do we need to rely on those those monolithic platforms or how can we sort of prove that perhaps there's a different way to architect these systems. Fantastic, thank you. And, and again, I know we'll come back to some of that um, when we open up the Q&A. So we'll um, next introduce our next speaker is Kelly Schneider. Um, Kelly is a US-based public sector consultant who helps state and local agencies make data-driven decisions to advance technological adoption, mobility, and inclusion initiatives. Through her work on Deloitte's Inclusive Smart Cities team, she has become an advocate for leveraging digital solutions that advance inclusion and equity in cities. The team's inaugural paper, Inclusive Smart Cities, Delivering Digital Solutions for All, was presented last year as part of uh, DC's Smart Cities Week. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly, and please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. The floor is yours. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, so as she mentioned, my name is Kelly Schneider, and I am part of Deloitte's Inclusive Smart Cities team, which is an effort within our broader smart cities practice to find ways to ensure that these digital solutions that we're working on with our clients um, can help advance inclusion and equity instead of exacerbating some of the gaps that we've seen. Um, so as, as many of you know, as urban populations are growing, they're becoming increasingly diverse. Um, Cities are trying to meet that by developing and deploying technologies that are improving quality of life, um, improving livable environments and sustainability and um, access to public services. And uh, what we've seen is that while these technologies are great and, and they work in many ways, there is a gap in that they can exacerbate some of these inequalities that we're seeing, um, particularly shout out to Grata for those populations that don't have this digital access. And so there can be a lot of um, unintentioned or in, unintentional consequences um, that leave communities behind. 
Uh, so this manifests itself. Um, front and center, we mentioned COVID as being just absolutely instrumental to being able to receive an education now. Um, families that don't have that, um, we all know, are not able to actually educate their children and that can have a generational impact. Um, but there's also a lot of behind the scenes or maybe less visible unintended consequences as well. Um, for example, AI bias, um, AI, AI bias leading to racial disparities, disparities in um, wrongful ID for face recognition, um, and even some of these like innovative mobility solutions um, impacting the way that disabled people are able to be mobile within a city if your new innovative mode doesn't account for things like disability or access, that's going to create a gap for those people that then they will not, you know, not only be able to not use this mode, but as um, technology innovates off of current modes, that will block them out in the future potentially as well. Um, so what our team did, and I'm a consultant, so I'm going to show some slides for y'all, is um, we developed a white paper. Let me get it going here. Um, we developed a white paper that is a way to help cities make sure that the tech advancements, uh, like I said, advance inclusion and equity instead of um, making that digital divide even larger. So uh, this first slide here is just really quick how the report came about. Um, I probably don't need to make the argument to anyone on this call that diversity and equity and inclusion in cities is a moral imperative. It's super important. Um, it is um, instrumental in advancing things like long-term sustainabilities for communities, um, long-term health outcomes as well. Uh, however, we also wanted to show that there is an institutional and an economic incentive as well um, for having inclusive cities. Um, a report by the Urban Institute in 2018, in fact, showed that the cities that are more inclusive are those that generally perform a lot better economically. So. Um, with that context in place, we reached out to um, municipal officers um, around the U.S. We interviewed 11 people across six states in addition to doing our own uh, research to come up with uh, this framework here. So the research resulted in a framework that um, is designed to help cities think about the way that they approach inclusion when they are de um, developing and deploying what we call smart solutions. So this framework is based on six, what we call enablers. Um, and a good way to think about the enablers is that they are um, different parts of the way that cities design, implement, and evaluate smart solutions. So if you factor inclusion into these enablers, it's likely that you're gonna be able to help improve inclusion in your city overall. Um, so the six here, I won't dive too much into data and digital because our colleagues on the previous panel uh, did a great job covering that. Um, but for ecosystem, um, a way to do this is by driving community um, co-creation. And what we mean by co-creation is yes, making sure the right people are in the room, but it's also leveraging the systems and the great community leadership that are already in place. Um, for finance and funding, um, incentivizing innovative inclusion. So this could be done through uh, procurement requirements, having an inclusion component, uh, as well as we've seen different grant challenges across the United States. Uh, especially in mobility, um, say that, hey, you know, we want, we're coming up with this grant, tell us how we can better, for example, um, give mobility access to veterans or to the elderly. Um, for internal organization, um, Greta, I'm gonna shout back out to you again because this is something that um, can give government leaders the ability to actually stand up and run with the solutions. So like, when we talk about how re ready we are for data, you know, some of the failures that we've seen recently, if we actually look at the internal processes and we say, okay, we want to, you know, work with these super advanced technologies, but everyone is still running like a waterfall procurement process or a waterfall development process instead of an agile one, that might come into conflict with the types of technologies and the speed at which cities can um, deploy them in order to like be equitable and keep that in mind. Um, finally, policy and regulation. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any public sector uh, workers or leaders on the on the line. If there are, thank you uh, for what you do. Um, and second, you could probably say way better than I could about how important funding is and, and how uh, constrained resources can be in, in this area um, and how hard it can be to kind of push the ball forward. That said, um, there are different ways such as uh, councils that uh, tap local leaders or tap um, community members that have a diverse and repre representative sample 
um, to be able to bring community into the fold without you know, a, a ballot initiative needing to take place. Um, so what success looks like uh, we've seen is this, um, for example, Boston Beta Blocks. Um, they started to set up new and innovative initiatives in their city, but what they realized was that um, the, the engagement and the transparency that they wanted to see wasn't quite there. So they formed this Beta Blocks Commission in the mayor's office, which um, allowed uh, representative, diverse, anyone, you know, to kind of come in and actually test and provide feedback on that technology to make sure that it was something that was designed with the resident in mind instead of just deploying this technology. So it really met the, the resident need there. Cool. And lastly, just really quickly, um, I'll talk about putting this framework into action. So every city is different. Uh, the context in which they're operating is going to have different questions, different, you know, disadvantages communities, different marginalized communities. Um, so what we did in this paper was just come up with a couple questions that cities can ask themselves at each phase of developing a smart solution to make sure that they are in fact designing with their community in mind. Um, so for the actual design phase of it, things like, have we actually talked to the people that are on the ground and that are gonna be using this solution? Is this something that they've asked for or is this something you know, that we think they need and so we're telling them and being able to incorporate those considerations and that feedback. In implementation, um, choosing pilot locations that actually are representative of the area that you're going to be deploying in is, is really important. Um, and lastly, unconscious bias. So not only making sure that your key performance indicators, your KPIs, and your metrics are looking for inclusion um, components, but bringing back in those community members that you brought in at the very beginning to say, okay, here's what our metrics are saying, but you know, what did we miss? Do you tell us, help us identify potential blind spots? So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you, Thank Kelly. You, Kelly. I, I, think I think in the interest, the interest of, time, of time, we'll, we'll skip, the skip the question, how do you, how do you come, come back, back for the Q&A? &A? Um, but thank you thank for, you such, for a such a thorough, thorough overview. overview. Great. So our next um, panelist is Dan O'Brien. Uh, Dan is the director of the Boston Area Research Initiative at Northeastern University, a city which he'll tell you more about and also one that's close to our home, our hearts in uh, Swiss Next Boston. His recent book, The Urban Commons, makes the case that there's a lot more to smart cities than fancy tech provided we can collaborate with and across communities in the use of innovation. So with that intro, I will hand it over to Dan to uh, give us a little bit more info. Hey everybody, um, and thank you Alicia and team for, for having us be part of this um, fascinating conversation. Um, and it's funny, I'm going to share some slides in a moment. I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, I, I don't know how much more there is to say. I, I loved everything that the last three speakers shared with everyone. Um, and especially uh, the, the shout out to my colleagues here in Boston um, who, who built the Beta Blocks program. But so why don't I jump right in um, to that with, with a little more preamble. Um, oops, sorry, got to share my screen. Um, and you're all looking at my email, wonderful. Um, there we go. Okay, so smart cities. We've, we've already bludgeoned this term in the last 20 minutes, um, but I'm going to do more um, piling on. Uh, and, and so, you know, to, to kind of build a straw man and beat a dead horse a little bit here, Smart cities, when we talk about it, we often think about these things, right? We think about autonomous vehicles. We think about ubiquitous sensing, um, putting sensors on every street corner. We, we talk about these Link NYC kiosks in New York that are supposed to be, you know, the, the 21st century version of a public payphone. Um, you know, remember those things that you can put a quarter in uh, and call people. Uh, we think about this probably outdated reference to this Tom Cruise movie, The Minority Report, um, with predictive analytics and being able to anticipate the next crime. And I don't want to say that these things are bad ideas. Um, they, they potentially could be really transformative at some point. Um, but, but I do want to ask some questions about kind of the divide between this sort of science fiction-y approach to smart cities and, and what the opportunity really is right now. And, and I want to raise a handful of discontents. And I, I don't know that they're too different from some of the things that have already been said, but I think they, I, I might phrase them a little bit differently, right? One is 
we suffer from a problem of technology is the answer. What was the question, right? Kind of a, a shoot first, aim later. Hey, we can build it. And then hopefully the people will be helped in some way approach. And related to that is this real deep issue that has come up with some of the other speakers of, are we addressing the real needs of communities? Do we know what, you know, in, in Boston, I always reference Mattapan, which is a relatively um, disadvantaged majority black neighborhood in the south of the city, right? Do we know what the people in Mattapan want and need? And do we build technology for them as we're doing this? And then there are some serious digital divides that, that are worth considering here. One is between have and have not communities and institutions that can and cannot work with these data, right? The, the conversation right now is dominated by the private sector, the public sector, and academics, but what about the nonprofits that serve local communities, right? What about community organizations and, and those individuals that um, really are going to be impacted by this? Um, and then also between can and can't afford cities. It's nice that Boston where I am based can do all sorts of cool stuff with data and technology and the same thing for New York and Chicago and Washington DC and Seattle. There are the resources there to lead the way in the innovation, but then how do you get that innovation out to Wichita, right? How do you get it to Worcester? How do you get it to Bangor, Maine, right? Th those are challenges that we haven't solved yet. Um, so then it leads me to really ask this question, what does it mean for a city to be smart? And when you think about a smart person, a smart person is not a technology. It is not equivalent to the technology, right? A smart person knows how to use technology. A smart person uses technology effectively when needed. But really what a smart person is, is someone who can gather information, who can coordinate it, synthesize it, um, identify problems, and, and um, creatively problem solve with the information that they have. Um, and, and so it's more than technology. And how do we achieve that as a city? How do we be cities that can grab the information that we have and make clever, intelligent decisions based on the information with or without sensors on every street corner? So I, I want to make the argument that there's this real opportunity that we're sort of overlooking by jumping to 2050, by jumping to 2075 with our, our emphasis on science fiction-like technologies. Uh, this idea of transformation in the mundane, right? We have all this naturally occurring data, right? This is a picture of data on tax assessments from the city of Boston, a really boring thing for me to put in presentation. But, but I put it up here because this data set, while really boring on one level, contains 170,000 rows that tell us about everything that is at every land parcel in the city of Boston. This is a rich rich resource that, that essentially describes the landscape of the city. And you can take something like this and translate it into beautiful visualizations, meaningful analyses, the kinds of things that we want to know about the city. And really, that's just one very simple example here. There's a vast array of applications. We collect data on everything from transit to housing to education to health, right? The list goes on and those basic data sets that on some level are really boring are also the basic foundation to understanding the day-to-day -day patterns of our society and the pulse of the city. And we can even take the word city out and put in rural community if you want, right? A county, right? We can use this anywhere in any way on a vast array of applications. So it's also accessible to all cities and institutions when structured this way, or at least more so, right? It's a lot easier to bring in an intern to play with some spreadsheets than it is to put sensors on every corner. And the future is now, right? We can do this now. We can transform our communities this way now. And we can work on the futuristic tech in the meantime, right? That can happen. We'll get there. But we, we want to see dividends now if we're really claiming impact. So. I generally eschew the term smart cities for urban informatics, which is just sort of a non-sexy way of saying we're going to use data and technology to better understand and serve cities. So just very briefly to give you a little bit more background on where I come from here, I'll, I'll stop the evangelizing and talk about my actual work for 30 seconds and then hand it back over to Alicia. Um, so I run a, a center at Northeastern University called the Boston Area Research Initiative. Um, and we intend, or our goal is to convene researchers, policymakers, practitioners, and community leaders to envision and realize the future of the city. And we really, you know, in similar to many of the, the presenters before me, we want to go beyond the kind of fancy tool efficiency 
aspect of smart cities and think about how do we use these tools to achieve other societal values, things like equity, justice, democracy, um, and increasingly thinking about inclusivity in this space. Um, and we have a primary focus on Greater Boston. We are very much a place-based organization, um, but we partner with cities around the world and partners who um, run similar centers around the world to think about how these models really work and extend to other places. And you can learn more about us at our website there. Um, and we do this in three ways, right? We pursue, pursue core research policy partnerships. If you want to see change in the world, you have to demonstrate what you think that change is going to look like. And we work with partners in, again, education, transportation, crime, um, neighborhood services, so on and so forth on various projects, which I'm happy to elaborate on. Um, but we're also really committed to the idea that this is going to take public goods. Right? So we have invested deeply um, with support from the National Science Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation to build this public data portal, the Boston Data Portal, where we publish all the data that we can from our work and try to make big data accessible to the community, both as documented data sets, but also as point and click maps that people can come in and we teach community groups how to use this to advocate for their communities. And last, we're very much committed to convening and supporting this thriving civic data ecosystem in greater Boston. We train community groups and public agencies on how to use our data and other data sources, but we also have an annual conference that we host um, where we bring together the full community. It's more or less 40% academics, and then everyone else is policymakers, practitioners, private corporations, speaking about their data-driven work in the region. And this year we had, even though it was online webinars, we had 600 attendees um, uh, attend, and it was just, it's just a really valuable way of bringing everyone together to, to be self-conscious that we are working together to advance the city using data and technology. So that's my spiel. I will stop sharing now. Um, but I hope I give some, some background on, on the perspective I'm coming from. Thank you, Dan. I think that was very helpful. And I think it's something, again, we'll come back to in the, the full Q&A. So I'm actually gonna call the, the rest of the panelists back up so that we can um, dive into a, a set of communal questions because I, there is a, quite a bit of overlap on what everyone discussed. So it looks like we just need to call them up and um, what we have. All right, well, while everyone's getting in, I'll, I'll open it up to Eve to ask the first question. Hi, and again, thank you for this fantastic panel a lot of information and, and it's very clear that if you follow the first panel where the keyword were participation right design uh education governance um and and we're coming to you and and we heard that in fact i know it's a bit of gross generalization but data if it's not well thought through is in fact just reproducing if not accelerating the inequalities my question to you is how do we build trust i've, I've seen some of you i think with you kelly this thing about social trust and you then also trying to really reflect about uh, the city as a place where you can really build and bring all the stakeholders. Uh, I'm, I'm still a little bit struggling with the questions of how do we bring the people around that? How do we bring this trust when it comes to something which is so difficult to, to grasp, right? When, it, when it's about data. I don't know who wants us to start with that, but I'm, I would be very interested to hear that. Maybe, maybe Dan, can we start with you? with your own experience on, on really with the people and maybe also with then the other side of the people, which are the people who are governing the people. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm just going to be blunt and honest. I don't have a great answer for you. Um, I think this is a work in progress and we're working really hard to figure out the curricula that make this happen, right? So Kelly um, spoke about beta blocks in Boston and I was tangentially involved in that, not directly, um, but I was, I actually attended a couple of their events and stuff, and they did some really um, heroic things, right? They they had like they had an activity where they had young kids um, from disadvantaged neighborhoods like making T-shirts based on data and 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 technology to try to engage them with the topics. But they came away, and I hope I mean I'm actually going to see the person who directed Beta Blocks in about an hour and a half. Um, so I hope he doesn't yell at me for saying this publicly, but um, I don't know that they're entirely satisfied with what came out, right? They, they, they tried a bunch of things and they're not entirely sure it worked. And the problem is, right, you gotta do two things. You have to educate while also generating trust, right? 
I can I can teach someone else with a PhD what a sensor is um, and how a regression works if they didn't already know that. But it's it's a lot different and it's outside of our natural wheelhouse to really communicate that to people who don't have the, that education yet. And and I think we have to develop a whole new set of curricula to really get that material across to communities of color, to disadvantaged communities that that, ha that don't have master's degrees floating around, PhD degrees floating around everywhere, to really support them to understand what these tools mean and on their terms and in their context. And then you have to kind of instill trust through that training, but also after and before, right? There's a lot of carts and horses that have to go in front and, and beside each other. And, and I don't know that anyone has fully solved the, the order of operations and the content and the way you, you and, and have those conversations. Veronica, do you, do you uh, because that was, thanks Dan, that was a, a somewhat a US perspective. Uh, um, I'm just wondering how does that resonate uh, from, I don't know if we could say a European uh, perspective, Veronica? So actually, to be honest, I'm, I totally agree with Dan. Uh, I think we are really taking uh, tentative steps at the moment to problematize and to understand the issue. Uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, um, we also have another fundamental problem, which is exactly the fact that most of our debates at the moment about algorithmic bias, about uh, uh, city inequality, uh, about uh, um, the impact of data technologies, come from uh, the US. A lot of the debates that are uh, being produced about this uh, uh, are very US centric. There's a lot of work that is being done uh, in academia, but also a grassroots level also in, in, in Europe in this regard. But um, we are still very um, behind a, a, a more global understanding of the problem. And there are obviously there are projects uh, uh, working on this. Um, I don't know the Data Active uh, um, project in uh, at the University of Amsterdam has been working a lot on data and COVID uh, and data from the margins or or big data and and the global south. Uh, but again, so when we think about trust, we don't have to only think about the, the first steps that we're actually taking to problematize the issue, but we also have to remember that a lot of the problematization is not only US specific and has to be much more cultural and uh, globally um, and specific in many ways. So, yeah. um, can I, uh, I want to disagree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so That's great, I think, please go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that one issue that happens with sort of a, um, typical sort of NGO model is this idea that we're bringing expertise to communities and especially um, where, you know, something like data, which has a certain technocratic kind of aspect to it. Um, but I think that what we are learning in the US and, um, you know, maybe this is because we are also leading in terms of um, surveillance capitalism, unfortunately, but, um, <laughs> what we are seeing is that the folks who are most impacted by surveillance capitalism are in fact um, the leaders in um, producing the kinds of resources that um, can not only educate, but also really build um, power um, in those communities. So I just shared a couple of things in the chat. Um, Data for Black Lives is a pretty amazing organization that is built by and for the most impacted folks. And then um, the Detroit Community Technology Project has produced a number of really amazing popular education resources, including um, two zines on opening data um, in the Our Data Bodies Project, which actually does have a presence in the UK. Um, so I think we're seeing um, the a sort of flip the script moment here where like the, the, this kind of um, leadership is emerging in the most impacted communities. And um, it's sort of up to us to change the frameworks of, of how we interact um, and kind of move from um, an ed educating perspective to more of like a knowledge transfer or um, 
kind of supporting perspective. So I, I do think these things are out there, sort of how we link up with them. Yeah, I'll just add on to that really quickly, Greta. I think like meeting communities where they're at is super important. And so when you are bringing in these external tools, like I know Google Fiber has a digital literacy program that they've um, spun up and I think Kansas City in one instance or Louisville, um, when, you're, when you're doing that kind of thing, when you're bringing a tool or a skill to start Greta, exactly like you were saying, with the community leaders, actually going into that space of the community, I think is much more effective in building trust for the long term than kind of pulling people into a, you know, a private space, training them there, and then setting them loose. I actually want to build on that point that you're all making. We had talked a little bit about everyone having a seat at the table, that it's important to include all the communities in these discussions. But given the fact that many of the communities that are going to be affected by data and particularly by bias, that they are not data scientists, what does a seat at the table look like for them? What is the best way to get meaningful feedback from a community that isn't going to be particularly educated about smart cities, about data collection? Looks like Greta was going to answer, but maybe froze. <laughs> so if somebody else would like to jump in first. I really quickly say our inclusive smart cities team, we're trying to answer this exact question um, right now. And one of the hard things is like, what does what is our role as like a consulting firm in that? Um, I think the the bringing in folks right away into the design process and not, um, I think Dan, it was you that said like, instead of saying, oh, we have this technology, how can we deploy it? Bringing in people from the beginning and saying, what challenges are you facing in your community? Um, and then kind of mapping technology to that is, is potentially a way to start. So we, we've tangled with this a lot as well. Um, and we're a little bit more, I mean, I talked some technology examples. Our, our work internally, Bari's work is more analytic focused, right? So so if we're asking about housing, we're asking about education, you want to source the research questions as they were from community members and community organizations, right? What are they really engaged in? The challenge is who do you ask, right? And how do you engage them, as Kelly said, at the level they're able to engage, right? You know, and, and generally, essentially, you're asking people who don't, who don't necessarily do statistical analysis, uh, in their day-to-day -day lives or ever to generate hypotheses, right? Um, and to, and you, you have to have that two-way conversation. But the question is, how do you engage that? And one of the things that we've focused on as a strategy for getting those conversations to go, and I'm not sure that this is the right solution, but it has been helpful to us, is to find community organizations that operate as umbrella organizations, right? Um, because they are able to then bring into the conversation multiple perspectives as they gather those perspectives and to, to identify members of their constituencies who are able to, because to be honest, as, as a director of a center at a university, I can only maintain so many relationships and it's hard for me to find individuals in every neighborhood. So groups like, you know, NAACP Boston chapter is a really valuable, you know, partner because they speak to the multiple um, African American constituencies within the city and and the organizations that they support or Massachusetts Association of Community Development Corporations can help us to understand how CDCs across the state are thinking about things in different places um, and you know bring in the appropriate partner um, in their group when when you know that will facilitate the conversation but but it makes the conversation more effective and so we've we found that these kind of mid level um, nonprofits that represent a diversity of voices are, are the most effective for us to partner with in trying to source that guidance. Hey, my um, internet dropped out, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I totally agree with Dan that um, like organizations like the NAACP can be really great. And in New York City, we just co-hosted something with um, the chapter of the NAACP here that was specifically on algorithmic bias and um, really they I think that I just want to challenge a little bit the um, idea that that these folks f that are most impacted are not educated I think we're seeing more and more the leadership that's coming from um, folks that are most impacted and um, that you know I think that it's really 
that we have a lot to learn from the people that truly experience things like facial recognition and the way that that um, feeds directly into the criminal justice system. So that's where I'd shout out, you know, Data for Black Lives or the, our Data Bodies Project as really, um, get, you know, giving voice and a platform to the, the lived experiences and the embodied experiences of black and brown people. Veronica, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, actually, uh, I have to say that I think that like uh, um, the, the focus on the civil society organizations that are working on the ground, and there are many that are working on the uh, ground on algorithmic justice, or, and they're super well educated, they are uh, overviewing different cases, they are out there to signal out bias. What we are actually seeing, though, at the moment, uh, or at least this is my perspective, is that uh, we have like uh, um, kind of clusters of debates. So we have like civil society organizations talking to certain groups of academics, certain uh, and certain, and certain uh, policymakers, and then we have other clusters where which are much more dominated by uh, different businesses and different uh, uh, networks. And I think that at the moment, what we really need to do is to start. Uh, understanding the different debates and what different people are saying, but actually to really create uh, a much more um, uh, dialogue, uh, projects like dance or, or Greta's, uh, people uh, like they are, uh, our data bodies that uh, Greta was saying, uh, people that actually document the lived experience on the ground, but also documenting the, the work of all those organizations that are actually fighting for algorithmic justice and they are trying to push and they go ahead every day for sure to do that. So uh, I think that that's something that we that would be important too. Excellent. I think we have time for just one last question. I know we probably could have talked for hours about this, but <laughs> I wanted to um, just touch on the idea that there are these clusters of um, of representation that are having these separate discussions. Have you seen in your work that there is conflicting desires that are hard to resolve and, and what are what's being done about those or what are some examples of those? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Veronica. Okay, so actually, I just finished uh, my child data citizen project, and the book is coming out now in December. But I kind of completely moved uh, a little bit, and I've uh, launched a new project which is called uh, the uh, the Human Error, and uh, and the aim of the Human Error project is really to look at this conflicting debates about uh, how do we solve the problem of AI ethics or how do we. Uh, solve the problem that actually when it comes to human profiling, these technologies are always going to be biased in some ways and inaccurate because they are human made, right? So, and we are seeing at the moment a lot of movements uh, uh, asking for algorithmic justice. Or, so I'm, uh, at the moment I'm, I'm launching this new project and, uh, so, and I think it's very important to look at uh, the conflicting ideologies and to also um, highlight how many times the issue of AI ethics is used as ethics washing and uh, how the people kind of, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk and talk about ethics principle or code of, uh, code of practice, uh, but again, how this uh, ethics principles are very context specific and very uh, culturally specific and how they take, don't take into account uh, the, the variety of uh, cultural engagement with these technologies and the, and the human rights implications of these technologies in different settings. So I think that this is something that is very important that we need to uh, highlight. So I'm curious, I don't have an answer, but I know that there is a question there. So uh, yeah. Does anyone want to add on to that? No. All right. Well, I guess we'll have to, to keep an eye out for that new, the results of that new project and see the answers that you come up with, Veronica. So I, I, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time quite quickly. I feel like the, the panel flew by and, and we've only just started to scratch the surface of what is meant by algorithmic justice and bias. And I think there are many conversations to continue to have. So thank you to everyone who participated in the panel. Thank you to everyone who participated in the chat. I think a, a few takeaways from, from this panel is that we have to be very cognizant of the questions that our communities will have and where those questions might lie. Um, and be good about collecting those and incorporating those in a way that is inclusive, um, but also recognizing that there's going to be conflict amongst the different communities and in the way that we interpret those needs. So that's, that's my key takeaway. I hope I know there were plenty of others. 
Um, and from the day in general, I'd say that we, we've raised a lot of questions and we've started to think about answers, but there's clearly a lot more work to do. And so in the frame of, of this entire event, thinking about the world in 20 years, I'm hoping that we'll have answers to them by the 20 year mark, but it, it certainly seems important that we are having these discussions today because the data is here, the collection is here. Um, so I would encourage everyone to continue to have these conversations offline. Please connect with each other. Um, use this as a catalyst to, to find new ideas and to find new perspectives. And Eve, do you want to add anything? Well, the only, only thing which I found interesting listening to, to both panel is, uh, of course, the relationship with the community and the fact that we need to go and, and really find where the community are at and not the contrary. Uh, and the other element is I found so interesting to reflect about the city. There is a role for the city. There is, they, they, that seems clear, the city as a structure, a social and political structure that came out so clearly, that is very powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. And again, thank you to all our panelists and all our participants. It's been a pleasure to host all of you. And I hope again, that you'll continue the conversations. We look forward to hearing what everyone comes up with perhaps in the next 20 years. Bye-bye.